Ms. Dancho, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the witnesses for being here in person and online. Uh, Mr. Wark, I'd like to uh, ask you a bit more about some of your opening remarks regarding intelligence gathering. I think Canada does a, a decent job, but it certainly sounds like we could do significantly better and contribute more. Perhaps we could um, have been included in the AUKUS, for example. We were left out of that agreement. I'd like you to comment on that. Uh, I'd also like your thoughts on whether you think it would be a good idea to have a dedicated cabinet committee chaired by the Prime Minister on intelligence and nas national security. Ms. Uh, through the chair, thank you very much for the question. Just very briefly, I, I think Canada does have some limited foreign intelligence capabilities, particularly those operated by the communications security establishment and to a certain extent by Global Affairs Canada. Uh, there is a lot more we could do. And Canada has, has often faced criticism, quiet criticism from its five eyes partners for being a bit of a, a free loader, free rider in the alliance partnership. I think the key concern I have is that we really do need to build a stronger sovereign capacity to understand the world and threats that are coming at us uh, from the world. And, and I think there's a lot of work that's being done in that regard, both with regard to intelligence collection capabilities, especially something that's forgotten, the importance of intelligence assessment, where we have a kind of scattered and diffuse system in the federal government, and also in the system by which we report intelligence uh, that we have acquired and try and make sure that that has an impact on decision making. Uh, we did say in the, in the uh, CG special report that we felt it was important to have a look at the governance of national security in Canada, and we, uh, which has for a long time, of course, been a very decentralized system, siloed and based on departmental mandates and expertise, with relatively little central coordination and control. We did advocate in that uh, report that the idea, uh, among others, that there should be a permanent cabinet standing committee on national security and intelligence. Such cabinet committees have been uh, in place in the past. Uh, it, they've currently been replaced by the Incident Response Group, as, as I'm sure members of the committee know, which is an ad hoc gathering of cabinet ministers and officials that deals just with emergencies and has, I think, little capacity to do any forward strategic thinking and planning. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now for Mr. Liepricht, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about some of the challenges we're seeing in the Canadian Armed Forces and our ability to secure um, our national security uh, utilizing the Canadian Armed Forces. We hear a lot about procurement, but I'm, I'm also hearing concerns about personnel. And we know it takes 10, 15, 20 years to train some of those top individuals in the Canadian Armed Forces that certainly provide expertise to government of how to proceed should the worst happen, for example. Uh, I'd just like you to comment on that. Do you think that personnel um, is, is lacking? Should we be investing more time and energy in this? And do you think it's at a critical point? Your thoughts. So over the last 25 years, the amount of demands on the Canadian Armed Forces have increased significantly qualitatively in terms of the complexity of the security environment and quantitatively in terms of what's required of the Canadian Armed Forces. Canadian Armed Forces are currently 7,000 as of February this year, 7,600 people short of their authorized troop strength of 72,500, but they're about 10,000 people short on the operational side. That means effectively that they're operating at 85% of staffing levels to meet operational requirements and mandates, and that has a significant impact on morale as well as on the ability of the organization to deliver on domestic operations on continental defense as well as on regional and international security, and it partially explains why the government uh, is more limited than perhaps it might like to be in order to uh, respond to current challenges. That is the result of 20 years of benign neglect, uh, where governments have chosen their force packages and force structure um, uh, and the operations that they go on. Uh, and with this emphasis on operations, we've neglected force reconstitution, force regeneration, and force sustainment. And so all efforts need to be on that front piece because it takes, as you point out, 15 to 20 years to train an experienced soldier that can then deliver not only kinetic operations abroad or for continental defense, but also for some of the complex domestic responses that the Canadian Armed Forces are increasingly called upon. Thank you very much. Uh, next question for Mr. Schull. Mr. Schull, can you comment a little bit on Canada's cybersecurity defense capabilities? Uh, we've heard at this committee that certainly there are some, um, our larger corporations have good defense systems, but it's our medium and small enterprises that certainly feed critical supply chains in our country that may be the most vulnerable. Can you comment on that and whether you think that there should be government discussion and perhaps investment in providing uh, support to our small and medium enterprises? 
Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, so the CSE has put in place something called the small and medium baseline controls. Um, and so these are, if, if companies just did that, chances are they'd be fine because no state level threat actor is going to go after a small business, especially if they're hard to get into because it's just not worth it. So we put, in, put the baselines in place. The problem is they exist. Most people aren't doing them. Most companies are not doing them. So what we have to do, the threat is not enough to spur them to action. So you have to incentivize them. So I would consider looking at a tax credit of some sort. If you, know, if you gave small and medium enterprise is 5,000 bucks back on their taxes, chances are they put those baselines in place. There's about, uh, you know, if you, all in, if every small and medium enterprise did it in the country, it'd cost you $50 million. I can guarantee you the, the amount of money being sucked out of the economy by cybercrime is a lot higher than that. So it's good economic policy, and it also makes our companies more resilient. Thank you very much, Chair. And thank you to the witnesses for your comprehensive response. Thank you very much. I would now turn to Mr. Chang. Uh, sir, you have a six-minute block of questions uh, whenever you're ready to begin. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, I'd like to thank all the witnesses for uh, joining